First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer, uh, Mr. Dizuno, Mr. Osaka, or Jason said, Mr. Miwa, and all the organizers uh, who uh, helped having the uh, MSAM symposium, which usually uh, takes place in, um, in Beijing. Um, it took place in Taiwan once, but now it's, I'm very happy that it takes place in Japan. Um, my paper is um, without any sun examples, so it's kind of theoretical. It's a question I have uh, discussed with uh, my colleagues in uh, France. Um, we have uh, in Paris many visitors, many students from other countries, and in fact we also have many uh, Asians, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and um, Koreans. And the question of intercultural relations has become a topic of research. And um, I was wondering uh, what it meant to discuss this issue in electroacoustic music. And um, I um, wanted to uh, study the theory, what had been studied and what had been researched in this field, and I will discuss that briefly, and um, I wanted to see whether we could add a category specifically for electroacoustic music, and my hypothesis that I would like to present briefly today is that yes, it is possible to discuss this regarding a special type of electroacoustic music, which is uh, mixed music, that is music for electronic parts and live instruments, and especially uh, in the case of traditional instruments, which is now becoming um, prominent. In the American literature, uh, this question is often called cultural synthesis and the, the fact that it has several names implies that the question is open and there is no uh, solution to this question. So I, I'm, I've, I've, been, um, I've been using a, a book which uh, uh, came out in fact but uh, 10 years ago, um, it's called uh, Locating East Asia in Western Art Music. And this, there is one particular article that inspired me uh, for this research. It's, it's by a Japanese-American scholar, Mrs. Yaoi Uno Everett, whom I will call Uno uh, from now on. Um, other uh, discussions of this um, topic came out of the NSAN and the EMS uh, conference. For instance, uh, Mrs. Mizuno uh, discussed the uh, electroacoustic music in cultural context in relation to Japanese electroacoustic music. In the case of electroacoustic music, we can assume that the music carries some specific features which may be linked to various factors. One of those can be attached to the local culture, that is the uh, national culture, if you will, while others are uh, shared among composers who choose to belong to a school, such as the Paris school that we discussed with Mrs. Shiono or the real-time interactive trend is, uh, of course, prominent. Or, for instance, Java Noise. Java Noise, of course, uh, has been discussed by Mrs. Mizuno, and it's, uh, there was a book in the US um, which came out recently, and it's, uh, it's a worldwide um, phenomenon. It's not, uh, it's, it's not limited to Japan. Um, how they share features can be seen from the perspective of how they absorb external influences while retaining some specific ones. 
the one coming from their own formation and culture. In other words, uh, which one are tropisms and which ones are native? In the real world, things aren't so simple and culturalist authors have expressed subtle consideration on the matter. So, um, in the uh, book by uh, Uno, in the article by Uno, the chapter, uh, the, there are several um, ideas which are uh, categorized. In fact, she uses the word taxonomy, so it's a classification of, of, of ideas. I'm also using um, ideas from the uh, long-time New York uh, resident composer Chu Men Chung, who helped um, really uh, develop relations between China and America, and um, and others, um, other authors. <clears throat> So, um, I will present her ideas in a minute, but right now let me stay on the uh, introduction for a minute. Um, at the same time, it's obvious that not all new music in Asia is linked, is linked to the West, at least not necessarily in their styles and more importantly in their aesthetics. In fact, one could define the term aesthetics as the stylistic trends but also the underlying substratum or ground or cultural features which pertain to a country. Um, those in turn have, uh, have their roots in religion, in mythology, in history, in the inhabitants' perception of how they perceive their neighbors, the family structures like Lévi-Strauss uh, discussed, and many other cultural assets. This could lead to the idea that music is strongly influenced by local customs and beliefs, and hence that national music exists. This is a debate um, in, among many musicologists. Is there or not national music today in the 21st century? Now, um, this national idea is shaken up by the complexity of the uh, communication technology that we live among today, which changes everything. In many ways, our situation is not unlike that of the early 20th century, at a time when the Italian futurist uh, appeared, and then the Russian futurist, and Mrs. Chiodo mentioned Apollinaire, which was very sensitive to his time. And at that time, there was a feeling that simultaneism was a, 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 an idea based on the technology of that time where you could feel, you could receive many different um, experiences of space and time compressed in a number of layers which reached you and instead of taking one thing at a time you would leave different times and different spaces at the same time. So this was simultaneism and of course it uh, um, uh, led to various um, art movements uh, which uh, Varese, for instance, was very uh, sensitive about. Now, um, in a paper given in the 2007 Asian Composers League, the ISCM ACL in Hong Kong, musicologist Funaka Fuyuko, Mrs. Funaka Fuyuko from Tokyo Gedaina, explained that there has been a process of canonization going on, that is a sort of a canon uh, with which people would uh, adhere, which people would follow. Um, and for um, the West, for Western um, civilization, 
region, um, there was a canonization of Asia. And for Asian composers and artists, there was a canonization of, of the West. So in other words, instead of um, really understanding the, the other culture, you would actually grasp the canons that would make sense to you coming out of another culture. So uh, she uh, argues, for instance, that uh, Japanism was uh, a, an example of uh, a canon. Um, and it appeared among many um, ex uh, experimentalists, American experimentalists, like the, the one we have here, uh, Carl Ruggles, uh, uh, Charles Seeger, of course, Henry Cowell, very, very much so, Harry Parch, um, Ruth Crawford, and um, Lou Harrison, of course, uh, very much so, and of course, John Cage. So they all grasp, you know, cultural ideas from the, from the East, from Asia, and try to incorporate those ideas in their music. But those ideas were actually ideas of the East seen from the West. Now, the, the, what Mrs. Fukunaka argues, it's, I think it's very interesting, is that there was a feedback of this feeling, of this Western feeling, to Asia, and that many um, Asian composers uh, started, started to follow this, what, what she calls, Americans' Eastern imagery. Americans' Eastern imagery. And that had an effect on post-war composers such as Takemitsu, and Mayuzumi, which I will discuss in a minute, and Somei Sato, for instance. So, she adds, the process of internalization, that is absorption, was at work in response to Western motivation. So, in other words, the uh, intercultural relation go in many different ways, but it's complicated. The, the regard, the, 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 the uh, look from the West has already been thoroughly scrutinized and my interest lies elsewhere. However, the uh, treatment by Olivier Messian of Indian music, which I touched upon in a talk uh, at the Japanese Musicological Society in Nagoya in 2010, is a case in point. American scholar Jane Passler discusses the work of Albert Roussel and Maurice Delage, two kind of obscure French composers from the first uh, part of the 20th century. And those uh, composers traveled to India and they each brought back ideas from India, from um, actual experience, but very different ideas. So um, what, she, what she says, what Jen Basler says, is that this is an induction like there is a technology induction processes. It is an induction of value um, in its uh, culture. Now, um, move on here. In the case of um, Mayuzumi, for instance, it's a very interesting example because the, the title of this piece is uh, totally misleading. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Work XYZ for Music Concrete. And this is because, um, um, as we all know, Mayuzumi was in France from September 1951 uh, to, uh, up, um, to May 1952, to the end of May 1952, in fact, May 29. So it's important to notice the date. He was in Paris, uh, following classes at the conservatory, and he, of course, he went to hear music concrete. So he had an experience, and in fact, he probably um, went to those concerts uh, of uh, May 21st and 25th in Paris, where a piece by Mission was presented. It's a it's the only tape piece by Messiaen, it's called Timbre Durée, Timber Duration, and it's based on a number of Messiaen ideas from Indian music, but also 
from serial music, like, for instance, series of prime numbers. So, Mission uses the first, the 11 first prime numbers, and makes a series out of it, and then, um, like any serial music, sort of um, changes the order, permutation, and, and, and all that. And uh, it's a totally abstract idea. It's, to, it's not concrete music, but he used those ideas to make uh, tape music with the help of Pierre Henry, whom we are going to listen to today. Uh, Pierre Henry was his assistant because Pierre Henry had been his student at the conservatory. So when Mayuzumi came back to Japan, he did his piece, this piece, uh, work XYZ, so in fact three pieces, and they are not music concrete at all. The, of course, they are tape music, but that's the only relation. And the music concrete is more than just being tape music. It's, it's, it's an idea of how it, what do you do with the sounds. And um, furthermore, the other pieces by um, Mayuzumi and Morui, uh, variation on the numerical principle of seven. This is totally inspired by, for instance, Mission, but also by Stockhausen. And Stockhausen had, at this time, produced two studies entirely based on the number five. So instead of having a series of 12 elements, like 12 pitches, he used uh, five as a number, so one, two, three, four, five, and uh, uh, apply those, those uh, numbers to uh, pitches, that is frequencies in that case, to durations, and in the first study to the number of sounds in each complex and the number of complex in each structure and, and, and all that. So it's totally serial. And in fact, this is what uh, influenced um, Mayuzumi more than his experience with uh, tape music. Um, let me um, move on briefly, otherwise I will... You'll tell me five minutes before because I, I have too much to say, so... <laughs> um, another idea which is interesting is uh, the idea of Orientalism. So the, John Corbett is an American um, author and a jazz player who uh, has written in the book I mentioned earlier about East-West relations and uh, he was wondering how uh, Orientalism functioned in the experimental stage and um, what different forms does it take within that um, compositional world and so these, these are the experimentalists I um, mentioned earlier. So these are the four, the three main categories that Mrs. Uno um, describes in her chapter. Transference, syncretism, synthesis. And I am adding extension that I will discuss uh, very briefly. So transference is actually um, the idea of aesthetic principles or formal systems without iconic reference to Asian uh, sounds or Asian musical practice. So it's some sort of aesthetic idea, some abstract idea of, in the mind of Western composers of Asia. But you could reverse the process and you could, you could say transference is also what Asian composers can derive from this, their experience of Western culture. But again, this will work by the process of canons or Japonisms. Japonism works in, in both ways as well. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to mention in this Emerson Symposium is that um, so far 
this question of intercultural relations have been studied very little. Um, I was looking at um, uh, large books before I came uh, to prepare this lecture, and uh, I was struck by the by you know by look, seeing that in the 60s and the 70s, large Western encyclopedias, for instance, did not mention Asian composers or did not devote any article on uh, Asian music. Now, this is changing a little bit, like the, the book that Mrs. Shono used, where it, there is my article, there is an, also another article on uh, Takemitsu and other Japanese composers and in, West, in um, contemporary music, again by Ongaku. So this is a new phenomenon, it's starting, and now we, we are seeing more and more of those discussion of how do composers from other cultures uh, work in contemporary music. And how can we describe their, the, the complexity of their musical thought? It's, it's, it's a, or very interesting. I, um, I have mentioned once already the book by uh, Italian musicologist Luciana Galliano. Her, her book is simply called Yogaku, so it's a Japanese name for Western music. And uh, it's also subtitled Japanese Music in the 20th Century, and it was published in 2002 in English. And she recently wrote a book on Joji uh, Iwasa. There was also the PhD by Judith Hurd, which is a, a very interesting source of information for us who, don't, who can speak Japanese or can read, can read Japanese. So now we have also books by um, Asian composers who spend time in Europe or in America and they write about music from Asia, like, like this is uh, Yao Linni, who took part in several Insan Symposium. She just published a book, uh, which is in fact her PhD, um, about the Taiwanese composers uh, who were trained in uh, France. So we, have, we see this, uh, this uh, question. So this question that is discussed in this article can be uh, described as the problem of appropriation. Appropriation versus distinction. So how do you appropriate and how, you, how do you distinct yourself from what you learn from the other culture? And in fact, how can you understand another culture if you spend just uh, six months or a year in another country? So it's, it's, it's a problem which uh, is really very much on my mind. Appropriation can lead to various behaviors such as syncretism and synthesis. Distinction would tend to preserve vernacular forms of expression. It feeds upon its own culture. Now, the, the field of electroacoustic music is by no means solely uh, defined by acculturation. The styles and practices born from Western studios uh, in the 50s and 60s and le later did spread around the world to various regions. For instance, the NHK studio in 55 was based upon the Cologne studio in Germany from 51 to 53. Um, however, the nature of the encounter with composers from other cultures remains to be studied. This is a, the, the main point of my talk, so that we, we, we know very little and there is a lot to, to study and a lot to learn. Uh, Western composers who became sens sensitive to aspects of different cultures posed the same question. Um, th there are now many, many uh, traveling composers uh, um, we travel the world over, we, we discover other people and other cultures and other music. And how do we integrate uh, those uh, experiences is the um, is problem. 
So, uh, going back to transference, the first category. So this category was discussed by Uno as well by, uh, by Corbett. Um, composers like John Cage uh, is a good example. He uses uh, Asian thought, such as the um, Taoist uh, I Ching. Um, but he does not draw upon Asian musical forms, and he does not uses, um, or use sounds or scales of music, musical time from, from, from Asia. This is, for Corbett, an example of conceptual orientalism, as well as an indirect reference to another culture. For Uno, this attitude is based on drawing aesthetic principles or formal systems without iconic reference to Asian sounds. Now, the um, next uh, category by Uno is syncretism. And in fact, it's a broad category, and Uno distinguishes uh, several types of syncret syncretism. One, of one, for instance, in which some modes of playing and Asian instruments are transferred or transcribed on Western instruments. And the other is a juxtaposition of Asian and Western instruments playing their own style. And of course, the uh, main example is November Steps, uh, for instance, by Takemisu or other pieces. Uh, a very well known piece. Um, so, the, the um, idea of cultural syncretism was uh, introduced in the 1930s by uh, a woman anthropologist, Elsie um, Parsons, American. And it was the process of juxtaposition of practices which was governed by the uh, recognition in another culture of elements which we, we can relate to, we can interpret and understand using our own canons. So, in other words, you go and fish some elements that you can carry back to your own world, so to speak. Um, this is a category that Corbett also calls decorative orientalism, Decor dec like a decoration, decorative orientalism. Um, he goes on and goes a little further and calls it contemporary chinoiserie, you know, the chinoiserie. So you import some uh, striking elements that you don't understand at all, but it, it looks good and it makes sense to you. So it doesn't really mean very much uh, to you, but in fact, it can, it can also uh, have a feedback and we have chinoiserie made in China for the Western public, for instance, something like this. So there is a lack of integration of those elements which remain on the outside of the work, like decorative features, which obviously do not belong to the language. This is a particular form of syncretism. And finally, the last category is um, syncretism. So this is more defined. So in syncretism, according to Uno, there is, there can be juxtaposition, there can be independence, there can be mixture, there can be opposition. So all those elements. And one example would be Stockhausen Telemusik, a tape piece in um, um, five channels that uh, Stockhausen did in 1966 at the uh, Tokyo NHK studio as a commission. Japan. And um, in this piece, uh, each section starts with a percussion, which is actually Japanese percussive instruments, either from uh, theater or from uh, religious rites. But each section starts with a percussion, a, a pattern that um, Jonathan Harvey later used in 1980 
in this piece more to a splendor, uh, derived from stochasm. Absolutely. So um, this this is um, um, an example in the stochasm uh, case where um, not only does he use percussion instrument, he also uses uh, Japanese music or Japanese religious chants, chanting, um, which those recordings are uh, processed by ring modulation and filtering, so they are integrated in an electroacoustic texture, but they are native, and for him they are meaningful, so it's not decorative, it really gives a sense, a meaning to the music. He also uses, by the way, um, sound from other cultures like Italian, um, sorry, Spanish flamenco, um, and uh, gee, I forgot other uh, other music from, from uh, not so many, just a few. So in each case, uh, the music that is used by Stokasa has for him a strong meaning, and we as listeners are touched by the integration within one uh, uh, unity, which is the piece, of all those different elements which talk to us at different moments. So this is a um, case of actually um, synthesis. So in the case of Stockhausen and um, this particular piece, the music, um, this would uh, correspond to the category of synthesis. So synthesis would be the higher level of the three categories that Uno uh, is discussing. Um, so you have uh, transference, syncretism, and you have synthesis because syncretism is more decorative and synthesis is more meaningful in many ways. Now, um, I would like to introduce briefly uh, extension, which is the category that I am introducing. Um, now, there is a, a book uh, published by Simon Emerson, a, a British composer and musicologist, teaches at uh, Leicester University. Um, it's a book called Electronic uh, Media and Culture. Uh, and uh, it's a collection of chapters by different authors and he wrote a chapter on a piece which he composed for uh, classical uh, Indian performers and uh, Western instruments plus electronics. So he goes on in this article talking about his experience working with performers who are expert in another culture, cultures and music, that is Indian music in this case. Uh, he also worked with a Korean performer. So he had Indian performers, he had one Korean performer um, and on the Kayagu. And um, he wanted to uh, understand what could he do with those uh, traditions. And in fact, in the Indian tradition, there is improvisation. So he had to include improvisation in his piece. So his approach to electronics, the electronics was the, the linking point, the linking method between Western instrument, Indian instrument, and Kayakum. Uh, his approach to the electronics part was akin to an extension, that's my theory, um, as he used samples from recorded instruments. He also used live processing, uh, reverberation, flanging, delay, nothing revolutionary, just something we use all the time, to emphasize certain timbre and texture of the live instruments, again, an extension. For the Kalagum, um, Emerson refers explicitly 
to the idea of extending the tradition in providing a sense of polyphony. So that's an extension, not of the sound, but of the structure of the music. Extension is particularly well suited for mixed music, as in the case of Emerson's. And um, today, many Asian performers uh, are eager to have a new music experience written, or that is to, to have new music written for them, so to uh, extend their own practice beyond the traditional music they have spent so many years learning. And many Western composers are very eager, very happy to work uh, with them because they are very dedicated and they are eager to learn also, so it's an exchange. Um, extension is a way to make this link in a meaningful manner. So the composer who, either from, from Asia or from the West, it doesn't matter, it works both ways, the composer is not alone writing on paper, but is exchanging all the time with people, performers, who bring their own experience and their own ideas. So the, the music takes a more meaningful uh, form at every stage. Now, in the Emson database, you know, the, we have a uh, uh, database of musical works. Um, that, that was the main project of Emson. So, in the Emson database of musical works, I looked um, to find how many mixed music pieces were composed in Asia. So, uh, we have about 1,600, uh, 1,600 pieces uh, today in the database, and about one fourth. Um, are mixed music pieces. I thought it would have been more, but then, of <coughs> course, uh, the database goes back to the early 1950s, when, you know, in those days we did not have much mixed music, mostly tape music. So, one-fourth are um, um, mixed music, but then, of course, um, if you look more closely, you see that in the recent year, there is a large majority of mixed music. And in the 50s and 60s, there is a majority of tape music. So the balance is shifting. And if you, if you consider mixed music, then you have to consider uh, the idea of um, exchange between uh, performer and composers. So, how much time do No, no more time. So, let's skip. Uh, to the, I, have, I have this uh, little drawing that is uh, just a picture uh, of all these ideas. And finally, the conclusion. So, as the links between continents become much more frequent, as traveling composers and musicians understand a little more the true nature in all its complexity of the countries that they visit, whether in the East or in the West, as composers themselves reassess their cultural assumptions, as we feel free to use whatever musical element we can in a rather postmodern attitude, the question of mutual regard, of mutual onlook, takes a prominent place in intercultural studies. It also takes more space in the musicological discussion of music coming out of any country. The question is, is there, yes or no, traces of intercultural influence? And if yes, how do they materialize? How do they manifest themselves? And what are the markers? In fact, the, um, the categories that UNO uh, describes can be called uh, gradients or markers. They are markers which we 
with which we can understand better uh, the cultural relations or intercultural relations um, or cultural gradients. So, which uh, which are the markers? Which are the uh, the gradients with which we can better understand intercultural penetration and integration? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. I especially like the notion of syncretism and the expressions like a decorative orientalism. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, what, what is the other? Um, it, it was really negative. Um, or the shidwazari. Yes, <laughs> yes, she was in. Oh, that person she was in. Yeah, and uh, so it sounds very negative in the Boston culture, right? Uh, it has some surface uh, treatments, and it's not authentic from the bottom of the like, inside. The core of the work is not authentic kind of notion. But on the other hand, that reminded me of the famous Japanese saying. Uh, propaganda by Japanese government in Meiji era Wakon Yosai, which is like a Japanese spirit and Western techniques, mm -hmm. right? So, in that context, uh, this surface treatment is not negative at all. So, it, it, this kind of um, contrast shows the you in the last mention about how, how the cultures penetrate it, each other. And the, but the degree and the direction of the penetration uh, could be quite contrasted uh, in these cultures. And I wanted to hear what you think about it. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Yes. In fact, um, this old uh, saying from uh, Beijing era, you find it today, today in China. Uh, in China, there is the, uh, the, uh, the um, it, it's political. Uh, the president of China, the current president of China, saying that uh, people have to be inspired by, by the West for technology, but they have to be inspired by China for their own culture. And in fact, uh, one effort uh, which is going on in China today is to, 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 to um, um, uh, stop being the, the factory of the world and become more creative. So, instead of just doing things with fa in factories to export, they should, in fact, invent ideas. So, this is going on today. Now, the, what, what I think is very interesting in the UNO paper is the, uh, the taxonomy, the differences of categories. So, what you describe, uh, the, the, the depth of understanding would be the last category, the synthesis in her uh, Corbett does not go as far as UNO, uh, but UNO goes further with this category of synthesis, and I think she touches upon a very interesting uh, topic, but her paper is rather short, and I think we, we need to study more. Um, the syncretism is very well described in your uh, chapter, but synthesis um, raises a lot of questions, and I agree with you that, of course, we um, are facing many examples of cultural uh, synthesis, but uh, this is not enough. We, we need to go a little further, and I think the intercultural studies have to take into account all the various shades and degrees of relations, including uh, chinoiserie and orientalism, decorative orientalism, and also synthesis, of course, because we, we we live in a world where there is more and more of that. So yes, absolutely, this is a major topic. Thank you.
でここでちょっとあの休憩で、えー、本当は、えー、次のセッションが始まっているんですけど<笑>ちょっと五分ぐらいお休みいただいてあそこにちょっと一応セルフですけどもこのようにございます、えー、開始を五十分からですね。